Not that long ago, we were taking a look at a street track in Houston, Texas, used by CART in the late 90s slash early noughties. Usually once that happens, it's not often that the same location will return again, as any prospective return ideas are met with a lot of caution, seeing what happened to the first iteration of the event. But, a new event is what we got, and in 2006, racing returned to the streets of Houston. The location though was a bit different, being at Reliant Park, the home of the Houston Texans NFL team. The Grand Prix would return via Champ Car, but also by the American Le Mans series. And the cool thing about this track is that the races were initially held at night. Everyone looks at Singapore and thinks, how cool is it that we have a street race done at night? And it very much is awesome. However, always remember that street racing at night came prior to it in Houston. Admittedly, I don't think it has quite the same glamour or spectacular surroundings as Singapore, but hey, they're minor technicalities compared to the main point. Also, let's ignore how the event returned to the daytime a year later. Anyway, the track itself would utilise the many parking areas of Reliant Park, and be just under 1.7 miles in length, with 11 corners, 8 to the left, and just 3 to the right. Or at least, that's how many corners it would end up having. However, let's just talk about the circuit first before we go into that. On a not particularly long start-finish line, Turn 1 is pretty much flat, other than the track itself, which is not flat whatsoever, meaning that you'll be gripping the steering wheel incredibly hard whilst going flat out at that corner. And then we come to what was meant to be Turn 2 on a 9-turn course. But there were concerns about the safety of that corner, given the incredibly long straight that came before it. So instead, a makeshift chicane was created to help reduce the speed. Then it's onto a 90 degree left hander that we were initially heading to, which is a fairly standard 90 degree. Whoa, 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 hold on. We're not just going to skip over this chicane without looking at it in more detail. Now, yes, it does look about as out of place as an elephant in the Arctic Circle. However, if we ignore that aspect, and how it was so tight and fiddly, and how it was a prime location for incidents, it did seem to improve the amount of overtaking this track had. Okay, it didn't even do that. Alright, fair enough, it's just a chicane that is there to slow the cars down, which it does very well, however it doesn't really have any other particularly redeeming qualities besides that. In fact, after the Atlantic series had their race affected by chaos at the chicane, the organisers of the Champ Car race decided that the start would be single file, and that passing would not be allowed at the chicane on the opening lap. And there were still mishaps occurring! Luckily for the next event, they added a better chicane layout, which produced far less mayhem, and seemed to flow more as well. Anyway, you know the corner that came afterwards, so let's move on to turn 5. An incredibly wide left-hander, which was in essence an open hairpin. Although I'm not entirely sure why so much space was utilised there, seeing as there's only one good line through there, which is to stay as close to the inside wall as you possibly can. Not a bad overtaking zone this one, which isn't surprising given the 20 million miles of width you have at your disposal. The road shrinks a little bit as you then come to a fantastic corner, a sweeping right-hander that arcs around the NFL stadium with the radius increasingly becoming less sharp, but then equally becoming ever more bumpy, with the car in turn becoming ever more unsettled. A fantastic corner this one, certainly the best made technicality perspective on the circuit. The next corner is a 90 degree left-hander, Woohoo! We're talking about these things again! The corner is simple enough, but the braking zone is incredibly tricky with a very uneven surface to factor in. Then another incredibly wide turn follows, but with only one good line that can be taken once again. A left hand sweeper is the corner description before going hard on the brakes again for a 90 degree turn, this time going to the right. Then it's a short burst of acceleration until you reach... well... a 90 degree... left hander. Let's just head to the next corner, which turns out to be the final corner, along with also having the pit lane entry on the left hand side, in what was a fairly decent pit lane as well. In the first year it was an almost flat out left hand kink, which was fairly open in width. However for 2007, the corner had a sharper radius which decreased the speeds, although it was still pretty fast. Then once you've done that, you've completed a lap of the Houston Reliant Park Street course. However, if you were a champ car driver, you may want to try and put to the back of your head that you've got to do the street circuit Sebring 99 more times. 
Tram Car and the American Le Mans series would race at the Reliant Park parking sections until 2007. However, with Tram Car and IndyCar merging together for 2008, there wasn't any way IndyCar could accommodate the Houston race into the calendar, which meant that for the second time, the chequered flag had waved on racing in the city, even though the crowds over the weekend were 150,000, and the city officials were happy with the event from a business standpoint. Hence why efforts were made to bring the event back, which came to fruition in 2013, with IndyCar returning. But not the ALMS, sadly. However, immediately, there was a problem. Six years since racing was last taking place there, a bump on the exit of one of the fastest corners of the track at Turn 1 had gotten so big that it wasn't safe for the IndyCar drivers to use. The bump would be sorted out once track action was done on Day 1, however an even more makeshift chicane was installed to at least make the rest of the track usable, so long as nobody was crashing at the chicane itself. Further work was also done to the curbing at the first proper chicane. The makeshift chicane would be removed, but that doesn't mean the bump was gone. Aside from that though, the circuit was pretty much identical to the track used in 2006 and 7. Some sections of the track were tighter, some corners were slightly more cute in angle, and when it rained, a stubborn section of standing water would not go away. However, its return also included some notable moments, one of which was, in my opinion, one of motorsport's biggest upsets in Carl Swertas winning the first race there of 2014. But perhaps even more notable for all the wrong reasons is Dario Franchitti surviving a crash that would end his career, along with 13 fans and an IndyCar series official getting injured. A crash which I won't show in this video. Yes, I know everyone survived the crash, but I don't feel comfortable all the same. Now, the event in 2013 was played with a tight turnaround time to create the course due to the NFL season. But in 2014, the race moved into a mid-summer slot, which meant that the turnaround time was better, but a different factor in the summertime heat was now something to contend with. However, it was announced on the 29th of August of 2014 that due to scheduling issues, the event would not return for 2015. Not even one year since the event returned in 2013. And that really is it for this event now, it's not returned for a fourth time, Seemingly, a third time is not the charm in this case. Or could it still return? Nah, certainly not at the time of this recording anyway. I mean, it's a shame that the event hasn't become a mainstay, especially considering the original track I went over was stopped because of construction works affecting the track layout, the second iteration was affected by two categories merging together, thus a lack of schedule space, and the third iteration because of scheduling issues once again. If a permanent home can be located where room can be found in the calendar, along with no immediate construction works being required in at least five years, then perhaps Houston could become a mainstay of the IndyCar calendar. However, in regards to this particular track, on the whole I quite liked it. It looks like a street circuit version of Sebring, a very rough and demanding circuit, with rain also causing the track to become very slippery due to the concrete circuit surface. Obviously a few issues when it comes to temporary chicanes, but on the whole a pretty decent track this one. That being said though, would you like to see Houston return to the IndyCar schedule? Say in the comment section down below, along with any other street circuits you'd like to see featured in this series. However, if you did enjoy this video, then I would be enormously appreciative if you did hit the like and subscribe button. But until the next video, thank you very much for watching, be kind to each other, and enjoy the rest of your day.